So everyone out there who's uh, watching, please make sure you uh, put your comments uh, or questions in the comment section or in the chat box, depending on how you're viewing tonight. And welcome to our Making Bird Connections lecture series. My name is Eva Matthews Lark. I'm the program manager of Hog Island Audubon Camp in Maine. Each week we are bringing bird focused presentations to you on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern time. These presentations are free, but donations are encouraged to help fund our programs. The donation link can be found in the comment section. I'll also drop it here in the chat box. Uh, but also consider checking out our programs that we have. Uh, we have both virtual uh, programs coming up in the future and hopefully in-person programs. You can find those at hogisland.audubon.org. This week, we're proud to have Tom Johnson join us for a lesson on birding by ear. Tom first came to Hog Island as a teen birder for one of our uh, summer camps. I'm proud to say he's been back many years as a part of our instructor team, most recently as a presenter for our teen virtual camp over the summer. Tom is a professional birding guide for field guides and lives in Cape May, New Jersey. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us tonight and lending all of your knowledge to our group. Eva, thank you very much for having me. I just want to start off by uh, saying it's a real honor to, to be here on behalf of Hog Island Audubon Camp, which for many years has been an incredibly special place to, to me and my family and, uh, and many other people I love and respect. So thank, thank you very much. And uh, we'll get started here. Let me turn on my screen sharing. And away we go. All right, well, this evening, I'm not gonna talk just about one thing. I'm gonna go kind of on a long rambling uh, talk through a bunch of different aspects of birding by ear, which is a sort of an intimidating sounding topic, but it's something that you can engage with at any level. It really shouldn't be intimidating. Um, so we're gonna talk about natural history of birds, how to make audio recordings with whatever equipment you have on hand, what the heck are audio spectrograms. We're gonna take a look at a few ID challenges, some of my favorite birds, the red crossbills, and we're also gonna do a little bit of birding in the dark. All right, let's get started. Just to sort of create a little framework for how to think about learning bird sounds, which is a, an, a uh, question that I get a lot when I'm leading birding tours. Uh, participants will, will say, you know, you know, we're out here, we're hearing 15 or 20 or 30 different, uh, different species of birds at one time. How do you remember all of them and how do you learn them? And I think the secret is that there really isn't a shortcut to this, but the best way to do it is to use what you already know and build on that. So you, you know, you recognize a bird from your backyard and you hear something else that sounds similar to that, but maybe a little bit higher pitched or faster. And by making those relative connections, you can really start to build your bird sound bookshelf. Along the way, you know, everybody makes lots of mistakes when they're learning birding by ear. And that doesn't stop, that doesn't go away. You know, every single day I go out here birding in uh, New Jersey, uh, a place that I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the bird sounds. I'll hear something every once in a while and, uh, and it'll throw me for a loop. And I'll really have to, to spend some time, you know, tracking that bird down and, and figuring out exactly what it was. And that, uh, that action really sort of enri uh, enriches the experience for me and, and, and helps me learn so that in the future, maybe I'll recognize that sound. We're going to talk a little bit about making our own recordings and uh, the value of that, not only for your own learning, but also for other people who are out there, uh, maybe hoping to hear what the birds are uh, from your neck of the woods. And as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's really important if you hear something and you're not sure what it is when you're birding by ear, the best way to figure it out is to just go track it down visually and, and actually see the bird, make that connection as you're watching it, hear the bird vocalize and create an anchor there between two different senses in your brain. So I mentioned before that you can, you can kind of engage with 
hurting by ear on multiple levels. And I really think of this as a, an opportunity of blending the art of birding with the science of ornithology. So you can go out there in the field and go birding by ear with just your ears, maybe a pair of binoculars, a notebook, and nothing else. And that's great. You can go out there and really just immerse yourself in bird sound, enjoy the sounds of the forest, and get a really rich experience that way. You can also go out and try to pursue particular sounds or species that are, uh, that are uncommon or make unusual vocalizations, make recordings, and learn specific things from those recordings. In terms of the journey of, of birding by ear, I already mentioned you want to build a bookshelf. This was an analogy that, uh, that Brett Whitney, who I am privileged to work with at Field Guides, uh, Brett mentioned this idea of, you know, you start with an empty bookshelf when you start birding by ear and you start, you know, you're, you learn your, your tufted titmouse in the yard. That's one of my backyard birds here in New Jersey. So, you know, you hear your titmouse, there's a book on your bookshelf. And then, uh, you know, chipping, sparrow, trilling, boom, there's another book. And you start to build these, these relative connections between the, uh, you know, the sweet, repetitive song of the titmouse and the fast trill of the chipping sparrow. And then you start to slot other things in between those books. And by, you know, before too long, you've got a whole bunch of bird books behind you. I think I already mentioned that you can talk about you know, birding by ear, both the art and the science, but I, I really want to underscore that it can be really enjoying. And I, I don't want this to be something that, that people get frustrated by. You know, when I'm out there birding by ear and I, I run into a, a problem or a hang up where I, I can't figure something out, uh, you know, I'll try to, I'll try my best to figure out what's going on, which species is making this unusual sound. At the end of the day, you know, you, there's no pressure. You don't have to go figure out every single sound you're hearing. So you can go and, and pick two or three different things each day that you want to learn, chip away at it, and before long, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's vocalizing around in your backyard and your, your favorite hotspots. All right, so with that under our belt, we're gonna look at some of the things we can learn about natural history from talking about birds. Now this is a bird that is starting to leave North America starting to leave the United States and Canada and head to its wintering habitats in Central and South America, the great crested flycatcher. Uh, this is a familiar bird here in the, the Eastern broadleaf woodlands of New Jersey. And it's a bird that I've, I've grown up with in Pennsylvania. And uh, it's now a bird that I hear all summer long here in Cape May. What we're going to do is take a look at some of the vocalizations that this bird makes. This is a bird that I, th I thought I knew really well. I thought I knew the bird's uh, entire repertoire, you know, everything it said out there in the forest. And we're going to take a look at this in a, in a special way. This is a recording that I made this spring in Belle Plaine State Forest, which is a, a tract of land here in southern New Jersey. And this strange looking blue and orange um, graph in front of us is a sound spectrogram. And basically what this is, it's a sheet of music that represents visually what the bird is, is saying audially. So as we go along, the horizontal part of the screen is time. And so this is going to scroll across. And then from the bottom to the top, we have the low pitched sounds up to the higher pitched sounds. So it's basically like a sheet of music. And I think many people who have seen great crested flycatchers know that they make this, this really loud kind of rip whistling sound that carries for hundreds of yards in the forest. But when I was listening to this particular bird this spring, I realized that it was making a sound that I had really never paid close attention to before. So I'm going to play a little bit of it, try to follow along. And if you can see my mouse here, look for this signature on the sound spectrogram. It's this little blurry section that isn't actually associated with the really obvious sound that the bird makes. So let's listen to that for a little bit.
we're actually hearing that loud whistling reep call, but also this little um, little trill of low pitch notes interspersed in between primary notes. And when I heard this, you know, I was standing right underneath the bird, just at the crack of dawn when it was starting to give its dawn song. And I realized that that little purring sound was coming from the great crested flycatcher. And it was sound that I'd really never associated with this bird before. And it's really different sounding than the rest of its vocalizations. And so when I heard that, I wanted to learn more. So I turned to one of my favorite resources, which is called Birds of the World from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I pulled up the Great Crested Flycatcher account and looked at what it has to say about vocalizations. And sure enough, you don't have to read through all of this, but just come down here. You can find that indeed a known part of the Great Crested Flycatcher's song is a modulated note, vibrato, a very brief duration and extremely low intensity. This note must be amplified in order to register spectrographically, which is what we just did as we, we watched the spectrogram play, play through. So this is a really strange um, part of the Great Crested Flycatcher's repertoire, and it was something that um, was a really neat sort of discovery for myself um, in a bird that I thought I knew really well, a common and familiar backyard bird. There's always something more to learn from your common backyard birds. If you want to check out Birds of the World, I'd highly recommend it. It's from the Cornell Lab, and it's got really detailed accounts for all of our North American birds and a growing body of information for all of the bird species found in the world, which is all of the bird species. All right. Oh, sorry, my dog is uh, woofing there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit now about how to make audio recordings. And I'm going to start off by introducing you to some of the gear that you can use from most basic to most advanced. So on the most basic level, you can use a smartphone with an audio recording app. Most of us have one of these in our pocket that we're walking around with. And this is a great way to be able to make a recording on the fly at just about any moment. We're kind of moving up in the complicated spectrum. You can use something like this. This is a shotgun microphone. This is a small one. And this is a, a larger one that offers more, uh, a little bit more directionality to your recording. This gray thing is actually not really part of the microphone. It's a windscreen that helps um, muffle wind noise from impacting the microphone as you're recording. This is the microphone itself. And lastly, and kind of on the most complicated part of the spectrum is this parabolic reflector or a parabola. And this is the, uh, this is the dish. And what this does is take sound signals that are incoming and anywhere on this dish, incoming sound signals get reflected right to the microphone. And therefore um, a sound target gets amplified and um, you can really hone in on specific sounds while rejecting background sounds. So that shows you how um, sort of simplified or complicated your audio recording can be. But I wanted to show you a couple of examples. This is what uh, a recording of a single Swainson's warbler sounds like made with these three different types of equipment. So we have a, uh, this is made with an iPhone. Here's a Swainson's warbler. Now we're going to listen to the same bird singing, but recorded with the shotgun microphone this time. You'll hear on both the phone recording and the shotgun recording that there's a bit of background sound. You'll hear that, that sort of static crackle in the background. And in the phone recording, you could hear somebody hammering. That was a sound from some nearby construction project. 
Now we're going to listen to the sound from a parabolic reflector that's really more focused on the actual bird itself, not as much background. So there, you can hear that the warbler is really bright and loud, and the background sound is really low and quiet. So there's a higher, they call it a signal-to-noise ratio here with the parabolic reflector recordings. And so the, the parabola is a favorite for ornithologists who are looking to create really clean-looking spectrograms. But there are some... Hold on, I'm having a technical... Up down here. Oh, we're on to the next slide. There we go. Um, so the parabola makes really nice, clean recordings with uh, really beautiful spectrograms that are really crisp and good for analysis. But you have to carry this thing around with you on your shoulder and bumping through the brush and tripping over it and all that. So there are trade offs. And what I'd say is the best microphone and recorder that you can take with you in the field is the one that you're willing to carry around with you. And for most of us, that's going to be something like a smartphone. So why don't we look at recording with a smartphone? What can you do? Well, my first instinct in recording with a smartphone is to just turn the video on on my camera and just take a video because you know that when you record a video, you're always going to record an audio track in the background. And that's one easy way to do it. But you don't get the same high quality audio file this way that you will if you use a dedicated sound recording app. Here are some good options for uh, Apple devices. Voice, Voice Record Pro is a really good one. For Android, RecForge 2 or High res Audio Recorder are some good options. There are going to be some, uh, some informational slides here you can come back to later. I believe the, the talk is going to be archived, so you can check this out at a later point if you don't want to take notes right now. So it's important to set that app up to make really good high-quality audio recordings. And in terms of the technical details, these are the, the settings that are preferred by the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So sampling at 48,000, 24 bits, recording in mono instead of stereo. Those are the basics there. You'll also really want to record in a lossless audio file. Instead of a compressed format, like an MP3 file, you want to do something like a WAV file, which is uh, an uncompressed audio format. So you can come back and check out these details later on. In terms of the actual mechanics of making recordings out in the field, um, what you want to do is make sure that you adjust the levels or the gain of the sound as it comes into your, your phone. And the important thing is to make sure you have a loud enough signal without it being too loud. Because if there's too much sound signal coming into your phone, then you're going to overload the recorder and you're going to get a lot of distortion or interference in your, in your sound recording. So that's what this says about wanting to have the sound peak between you know, the technical details would be between like negative 12 and negative 6 dB on the meter. Um, you just don't want that to get above zero, which means your recording is going to be distorted. So come back to that later if you need to. What you want to do is get fairly close to the bird so the sound is fairly strong without changing the bird's behavior. So you want to make a recording of what the bird sounds like kind of going about its, its normal business. One thing that a lot of people are tempted to do when they're recording is to make a really short recording, just of one song snippet, or maybe one dip, one or two call notes. And what I'd strongly recommend is that if you're recording a bird, to turn your recorder on and actually just let it run for a couple of minutes, um, up to two or three minutes, and try to record as many different iterations of the song or the call uh, as, you're, as you're comfortable standing there quietly. And that brings me to the next point. You got to hold still when you're making these recordings. So you want to keep your hands still when you're holding the phone and try, if you can, 
to shield the microphone on your, your smartphone, which is on my iPhone, it's on the bottom. You wanna to try to shield that from any wind because there's no real uh, wind baffling on the, uh, on the phone to, to prevent wind noise from impacting your recording. And at the very end, after you've recorded your bird, it's time to make a voice note so that when you listen to it later, you have some information associated with that recording. So, you know, let's just say uh, I was out here in my yard uh, Rose-breasted grosbeak recorded on October 10th, 2020 at you know, 4 p.m. It was a male and it was making chip calls as it associated with uh, a female that was silent. You can also give some weather details and other things that will provide more context for your recording later on. Basically, those are, those are the essential things that you need to know when you're making recordings. And that applies whether you're using a smartphone or making recordings with some of the more sort of enhanced equipment like a shotgun microphone or the parabolic reflector. You wanna get close to the bird without changing its behavior. You wanna to try to minimize the noise that you impart to the, the microphone. So with a shotgun microphone, you see that it's got this special handle that, that isolates your your hand noise from the actual microphone itself. There's this, this little um, isolation mechanism there. Make long recordings and put some voice notes at the end. Finally, it's a great idea, if you're willing to spend the time to do it, to archive your recordings for science so other people can learn and uh, make discoveries using your recordings. It's really easy to edit these recordings using some free software. There's a, a program called Audacity that you can download for free that allows you to trim your recordings down to the uh, correct you know, focus on the, the bird that you're particularly interested in. And you can you know, make sure that they're uh, at the correct volume for uploading. And then you can just actually save those and drag them right onto your eBird checklists. If you make eBird checklists to keep track of your birds, here's an example from earlier this summer in Cape May. I heard a warbling vireo and I made a recording of it with my phone because it was uh, an unusual date for this species here in Cape May. And um, I just dragged that recording right onto my eBird checklist and away it went. So other people could, uh, could listen and, and learn from that recording. Speaking of the Macaulay Library, I just want to give another plug here for the Cornell Lab. They've got amazing tools for birders, and uh, you don't have to contribute your own recordings. You can just go in and listen to other people's if you'd rather. Um, but one of the great things is now uh, you're able to add your own recordings to the Macaulay Library, which has been accepting um, recordings from ornithologists for many decades, including people. Uh, like Ted Parker, who have contributed, you know, over 10,000 amazing audio recordings from the Neotropics. And this is a, a huge and growing resource. So just here at home, I just checked this earlier today in Cape May County, New Jersey, there's now an archive at the Macaulay Library of nearly 60,000 photos of birds, over 500 videos, and over 2,000 audio recordings. And Almost all of those audio recordings are from the last five years, which is really neat. You know, we've got a changing bird landscape, as Brooke is going to talk about a little bit later, uh, in large part due to a changing climate. And having contemporary records of what the bird soundscape is like in a particular area is crucial to sort of preserving our ornithological history, but also understanding how things change over time. This is what the archive looks like for the photos and some audio recordings. So you get to, to go and, and watch those sound spectrograms go by and also listen to the audio recordings at the same time. It's a fantastic resource. Okay, talked a little bit about how to make audio recordings and some of the equipment. Now I wanna take you out in the field and show you uh, one of my very favorite uh, sound recording experiences. This is a, a species, Ross's gull, that's a, a very mysterious bird of the high Arctic that's quite poorly known as a, a breeding bird in North America. Um, 
I had the privilege when I was leading a birding tour in uh, the, the area formerly known as Barrow, Alaska, now called Utke Agvik, uh, to see these three Rasa skulls during a summer field guides tour a number of uh, years ago. And we got to see these birds and hear them calling back and forth to each other over the tundra. So I'm going to show you, this is what my setup was like. I, I managed to carry this around with me for a couple of weeks in Alaska, not using it at all until this moment when these Ross's gulls were right in front of us and uh, I got my microphone out and got to really enjoy uh, just sitting there in the midnight sun after midnight in Alaska and, uh, and watching these Ross's gulls do their thing. So here is a little bit of that experience. There was one sub-adult bird that two adults, two different adults were really interested in and they kept chasing it around the tundra, which is what we're seeing right now. For those who aren't familiar with this species, this is really one of the sort of holy grails of, of birding in the world. This is a fantastic, really, really cool gull and they get this beautiful little pink blush on their chest and body during the during the summer season. So that was a little that was a video clip and then I wanted to show you this is the sound recording I made at the same time. So this is an example of not really needing to uh, to make a recording in order to identify a Ross's gull. They're pretty darn striking in their breeding plumage with that black collar around their neck. This is more in a, trying to preserve a sound that I was hearing and um, and trying to capture that experience for the future. And now whenever I go and listen to this recording, it just brings a, a big smile to my face because it just immediately transports me back the tundra of Utkeagvik uh, on that, that June evening after midnight, um, long after the, the day of birding should have been over, but we were still out there. All right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, the pitfalls of, of birding by ear. We're going to change gears a little bit, and I'm going to play a recording that I made in my neighborhood quite recently, just um, earlier this spring. This one really threw me for a loop. Let's, let's listen to it. Okay, so I was driving down the street right in my neighborhood here close to my house and I heard this song, this bird singing out the window. And when I heard it, I thought, wow, that, that must be a prothonotary warbler. And I stopped the car and got out because it's kind of an unusual breeding bird here right in my, my local neighborhood. And when I got out, I heard it again and I said, well, it, it sounds a little squeaky and not, not quite right for prothonotary warbler. So I thought, um, what else could this be? Now I want to listen to uh, a recording of a real prothonotary warbler here and get an idea what that sounds like. So it's a little bit faster, maybe a little bit more sweet and regular sounding than that recording I played before. And I decided at that point I really needed to track this bird down because it didn't sound quite right for a prothonotary and I couldn't really figure out what else it would be. So I went and got out of the car and I looked up and finally I found this bird sitting up in the canopy of the forest. And I was just shocked because 
It was a very common bird singing a song that was completely unlike anything I'd ever heard before. This is what a normal member of its species sounds like. That's a pretty even sort of mechanical trill. Now that's a bird that I've seen probably, I don't know, tens of thousands of through my life. And I've heard, heard many of them. Basically been around this bird since I was a little kid. It was a chipping sparrow, but it was a chipping sparrow giving a really crazy song, a very slow warbler-like version of its trilled song. Now, chipping sparrows are in the group of songbirds called Ossine passerins that largely have vocal development that's based on, on listening and learning. So what I think might have happened with this chipping sparrow is that perhaps its, uh, its father, which would normally be singing on territory, perhaps, um, perhaps left or was killed or something like that. And this bird was sort of left to listen to a warbler, perhaps a prothonotary or black and white or something like that. And it ended up developing an unusual song. Now there's another group of songbirds called the sub that includes things like that great crested flycatcher and many of the birds in the neotropics that largely develop their vocal uh, repertoire through innate sort of hardwired um, sounds instead of vocal learning like the Ossian passerins do. Now there are exceptions in both, both directions here, but it's a really interesting uh, insight into you know, if you hear something out there in the forest that doesn't sound quite right, go ahead and track it down. All right, we're going to listen to a couple of cascading warbler songs here. This is a, an ID comparison that we're going to make based on two species of warblers that live here near my house in New Jersey, the yellow-throated warbler and the Louisiana water thrush. This is kind of some habitat of... Uh, Louisiana water thrush, a slow moving stream going through the forest. And above that would be where the yellow throated warblers like to hang out up in the forest canopy. But I grouped these two species together because they have generally similar patterns to their songs. And we're gonna play through first the yellow throated warbler. And what I want you to do is listen to the overall quality of the song and particularly the quality of the ending of the song. Yellow throated warbler first. We've got a downward cascade of whistled notes, clear whistled notes, with a rising terminal note at the very end. The quality of that final note, it looks like a little check mark or a, like a Nike swoosh, the very end of the song here on the sound spectrogram. And that's going to be really different when we look at the Louisiana water thrush here in just a moment. Okay, that's our last yellow-throated warbler song. Let's move to the water thrush next. Another cascade. You see those really vertical notes at the end, and those, they're, visually they look vertical, so that to our ear they sound like really clicking, harsh notes. Let's listen to that again. To my ear, Louisiana water thrush has a more sort of aggressive, uh, sharp sound to its song and a very sort of abrupt clicking ending to the song. Let's listen to it one more time here. So these differences are all things that we could measure if we wanted to. We could go in with fancy software and measure the differences between these songs, but in terms of making comparisons and making identifications out in the field, I really like to rely on comparisons between species that you know sound somewhat similar. And we're going to move on here to a series of three species of trilling songbirds, just to give an another example of comparative learning of bird identification. Pine warbler, chipping sparrow, and worm-eating warbler. And we're going to play these from slow to fast. So pine warbler first, chipping sparrow, and then we're going to hear two different worm-eating warblers. Here's the pine warbler first. Kind of a mellow, 
sweet trill. Now the chipping sparrow. It's a little faster, the space in between the trilled notes is shorter. Here's worm eating warbler. So that is a worm eating warbler that actually sounds quite a bit like a chipping sparrow to my ear. But here is one that you wouldn't necessarily con confuse with a chipping sparrow because it's really fast. Wow. So that is what the books are talking about when they talk about a buzzy, dry trill for the worm eating warbler. A very rapid, tightly spaced trill that almost sounds just like a long buzz to my ear. This is just a way of taking one particular aspect of a bird's song and comparing it between three different species that live in the same forest. If you were you know, a little bit farther north or over in the Appalachian Mountains, you might in, in, uh, involve dark-eyed junco in this discussion as well. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about one of my favorite groups of birds to think about when I'm birding by ear, and those are the red crossbills. Here's a crossbill flying over. Why are crossbills cool to think about when you're birding by ear? Well, they're really the perfect study subject. They're widespread in North America, so you can, you can find red crossbills in many different places, especially if you live out west. When here in, in Cape May, I have to wait for a really, uh, you know, an unusual year for them to show up during a, an eruption flight. Now their, their bill size and their, their overall head size and bill size corresponds to their diet. So different red crossbill types or groups of red crossbills feed on different types of conifer cones and seeds. So spruces and pines primarily. Now, the cool thing is that these different groups of red crossbills with their different bill sizes also have different vocal types. So some small build types have a certain call, larger build types are gonna sound differently. And it's almost like we're kind of having a window into a really messy point as uh, red crossbills are uh, kind of becoming different species. So we have uh, a bunch of groups that are almost acting like good species, but will still interbreed to some degree between call types and bill, bill size types. So it's messy, but it's an interesting active part of bird evolution that's worth checking out. So let's look at two different types here. These are the sound spectrograms of the flight calls of type two red crossbill, which is a ponderosa pine specialist, has a really big bill and a flight call that looks like a chair when you look at it on the spectrogram here. Then there's the type four red crossbill down below. It's a Douglas fir specialist with a medium sized bill and a really distinctive sort of plinking call sound that's shaped like a V on the spectrogram. So let's, uh, let's listen to these two. First in this recording, we're gonna hear a type four red crossbill and then later type two. Here come the type two. Okay, so you can hear how those sounds are similar, but they're actually, when you break them down and you actually get to look at them, they're quite different. So this is an example of uh, two different red crossbills that were actually in the same patch of forest, feeding temporarily at least on the same type of lodgepole pine in Idaho a few years ago during the summer. So I mentioned before that this is sort of an active area of evolution. And one of the really cool things is that our most recently described new species of bird in North America is a red crossbill. It's this one, uh, this one right here from Idaho called the Kasha crossbill, which was formerly described as the type nine red crossbill. And this is a bird that feeds specifically on lodgepole pines in just a couple of mountain ranges in Southern Idaho. And this is what its flight call looks like. If you listen to it, it sounds very harsh. It 
an ornithologist named Craig Bankman um, sort of isolated this call type and realized that this was acting like a really good full species. And so he uh, ended up writing a proposal to the American Ornithologists Union, uh, now the American Ornithological Society, and eventually got this species rep, uh, recognized as its own um, full species. The really cool thing about this is that the Kasha crossbill has evolved in the absence of tree squirrels in these two mountain ranges in southern Idaho. And that's reflected in its scientific name, Loxia sinuscurus, meaning the crossbill without squirrels, which is pretty cool. So when you're out there and you run into some red crossbills, if you're lucky enough to do that, you can make an audio recording and try to figure out exactly what type of red crossbill you found. And tracking those can give us a better understanding of not only how food resources are available across the landscape, but how these wildly nomadic birds are moving. And if you want a really good primer on how to separate the different, all the different types of North American red crossbills, you're going to want to visit this website that I have linked down here. Uh, this is a really nice primer of uh, crossbills from Matt Young and Tim Spar, two uh, crossbill experts who uh, are, are their big passion is sort of following crossbills across the landscape and helping to identify the specific types. All right, and now just to finish up this evening before I turn the the Zoom over to Brooke, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some research I've been doing here in Cape May that takes birding by ear and kind of flips it a little bit. So for many years, people have monitored nocturnal migration by listening to and recording the flight calls of migratory birds. And we actually know quite a lot about the different sounds that migrating birds make at night. There's a great example if you check out the, um, the CD-ROM or now the, the free website from Bill Evans and Michael O'Brien, there's a link right here, called Flight Calls of Migratory Birds. You can get a really nice primer, like a Rosetta Stone almost, to the, the flight calls of a broad swath of, of land birds in Eastern North America. So we know a lot about the types of sounds that these birds make. But one of the things that's critical in terms of monitoring populations and, and migration pathways is to be able to count those birds and understand how many of them are moving over in the darkness of the night when most of the small birds are migrating across North America. It raises questions like how often do individual birds call? And particularly, what is the difference between how often birds call when they're flying through a really dark, like a forested remote landscape versus flying over a city or a town with lots of artificial lighting? You know, it's, it's pretty well known at this point that birds increase their calling rate when they're flying by bright artificial lights. And that uh, might be to help them maintain spacing in the dark between themselves and other birds that could be nearby. It could be also just a signal of confusion that they're being uh, disoriented on some level by these artificial lights. So how do we figure out how to correlate the number of calls that we hear from migrating birds at night with the actual number of birds that are passing over through the darkness. Well, I've been playing around with some new technology. There's this really cool thing called a thermal optic or a thermal scope that detects the infrared signatures of birds as they pass over. This is a video from the other, uh, let's see, October 3rd from about 3.30 in the morning. And all these little dots, these little pale dots that are going across the screen like that, and a few more here. These are birds migrating over in the darkness. There's a whole flock going through there right now. Remarkable thing is just a few of these were calling. The rest of them were passing over silently. So the infrared scope helps give an idea of the total magnitude of birds that are passing over, even though they're not all being vocal. We're gonna look at another video like this. Here's Cape May City. Looking at the horizon, you can see how warm the buildings are after having absorbed the sun's energy through the day. There's the ocean, a rock jetty. And now we're gonna pan up into the sky. And again, reveals immediately all these little pale spots. Those are migrating birds passing overhead on a really heavy nocturnal flight. 
as viewed through a through an infrared device. So this is cool. It's kind of kind of geeky, fun to play with. But how can we use it to learn more about migrating birds? Well, especially if you are able to listen to birds' calls as they fly over, and then figure out how many are actually passing through using the infrared scope, and sometimes even using uh, visible light like this flashlight beam, you can really understand a lot more about what's passing through in the, at least in the lower uh, strata of the sky during an active migration night. So this is a bird that I want to talk a little bit about before I go here. This is the American bittern, one of the migratory species of herons that passes through Cape May in large numbers each year during the, the fall migration from September into November. Early October seems to be just about the peak of migration for American bitterns. And indeed, uh, just the other night I was out listening to some, this is what they sound like. It's a bit like a black crown night heron, but a little bit more like a barking call, like a small dog flying through the darkness. Here's another example of that, that flight call. Kind of an awkward sound to hear coming out of the night sky. But one of the things that's really neat about bitterns is they're, they're super secretive during the daytime and at night you can't see them. So there's actually very little known about their migratory behavior. This is a, a bird that breeds in large numbers across the wetlands of North America, including much of the boreal forest, but we still don't know very much about it. Now, one of the cool things is when you hear a bittern flying over, you can take your infrared scope and look up at the sky and see that one bittern. And it turns out, it turns out that there's often not just one. So here is a thermal signature of an American bittern taken after I heard some bittern flight calls coming from the sky the other night. So we start out watching this one fly. They're like, okay, this is cool. There's a, there's a bittern flying through the sky. You can see its wing beats. And then, whoop, what's all this? My goodness. So it turned out that this wasn't just one American bittern. This is a flock of 13 American bitterns flying over in the, the sky above Cape May. And more and more observations are showing that bitterns actually migrate in pretty sizable flocks at night. Sometimes they'll go over in ones or twos or threes, but I've been seeing flocks of five or 10 or 15 on a regular basis as I've spent more time looking at bittern migration during the last few fall seasons. So it's a really cool uh, way of combining a couple of different technologies and using, um, using some new tools to help elevate your birding by ear to learn new things about the way birds move across the landscape. Before this, I had no idea at all that bitterns flew by in flocks in the nighttime. Would have never known that from just going out and birding during the day. So with that, um, I want to thank you very much. I hope to see many of you at Hog Island in the future for a camp session. Um, and in the meantime, stay safe out there. And uh, I'm going to hand this back on over to Eva and Brooke. And if you would like to um, check out some entertaining and educational bird videos, birding videos, uh, we've been putting out a series of birding videos um, from field guides. It's called Out Birding with Field Guides, and you can find it at that link below. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll, I'll stick around for questions after Brooke's presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, we have lots of questions coming in, so I really appreciate all of your information on this introduction to birding by ear, but also by sharing um, some things that you're doing that are really unusual and, and probably people are, are seeing it for the first time. Um, so our bird connection presenter is Dr. Brooke Bateman. Brooke is the director of climate science at National Audubon Society. Brooke has also been a Hog Island instructor, so she knows our programs well. Tonight, Brooke will speak a bit about Audubon's Climate Initiative and Climate Watch. We are so grateful to have you here tonight, Brooke. 
Thank you, Eva. It's great to be here. So let me share my screen. Start my slideshow and share my screen. Are we able to see it okay? Great. Okay, so um, as Eva said, I am the director of our climate science work here at National Audubon Society. Um, and I'm going to talk today, today a little bit about, about Audubon's community science programs and hopefully encourage those of you that aren't already participating in these programs um, to start participating and how important it is right now for us to be doing so. So we just heard from Tom about how birding by ear is such a cool way to get into the science of birds. I it's just was mesmerized by that whole talk. Um, but I really wanted to kind of key in on one thing that Tom said is this um, change in soundscapes. And so how once we become familiar with the birds around us, we can start to become um, to recognize that there's been changes in the birds that we're hearing. And so we can use our skills, um, our birding by ear skills to kind of understand how birds are changing in the landscape. And so global change, when we think about land use change, climate change, these are issues that are occurring at a landscape scale. And as individual scientists, we can't be everywhere to collect data. So we really need landscape scale monitoring so we can both improve our model predictions of understanding how birds are gonna be affected by climate change and also monitor change on the landscape. How are the birds changing? How are these big global change processes actually affecting birds? And so that's where we can really tap into the power of community science. Uh, this map, I think, is just kind of a really striking way to look at it. Um, these are actually one year, one single year of data from eBird. So the darker the blue, the more eBird uh, occurrences that have been submitted. And there are hundreds of thousands of observers that are already contributing to community science by submitting their occurrence records of birds online. So what you can see is that we actually can get the information at that landscape scale, the monitoring that we need to help understand and piece together how birds are being affected by these landscape scale, climate change, global change, um, land use change issues. Here at Audubon, our strength has always been in our network of people that are interested in the well-being of birds. And Audubon's volunteers have always been at the forefront of informing science of bird conservation since that first Christmas bird count over 100 years ago. Uh, we have well over 300,000 participants across our community science programs and um, over 80 million occurrence records just from these programs alone. So these are our four main programs. I'm only going to talk about two of them today, but I do want to highlight all of them. Uh, Christmas Bird Count, of course, is our oldest, it's our flagship community science program. It's the oldest community science program that's um, been going globally on biodiversity. We also have the Great Backyard Bird Count, which we work together with with Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And this is a great family-friendly program to get people out, especially new birders, um, just to go out there and to um, kind of be like a gateway to community science. Hummingbirds at Home is another program. Um, specifically looking at uh, hummingbirds and which plant resources they use, and it's very tied to our Plants for Birds program. They have a great uh, scientific publication that came out just this past year showing that native plants do indeed bring more hummingbirds into your backyard. And lastly, Climate Watch, which is a program uh, fairly new that helps us kind of see how birds are already responding to climate change. So first I'm gonna talk about the Audubon's Christmas Bird Count. And I'm sure a lot of you on this call are familiar with this program or have participated in this program. Um, but I just wanna really briefly highlight how important it has been for the science and our understanding of birds. So Christmas Bird Count data have been widely used in scientific studies. Um, it's given us an index of bird population trends. It's helped us understand birds and how they shift their ranges. It's contributed to our um, climate change reports. Over 300 peer-reviewed articles, um, and that's increasing every day because people are constantly reaching out to, to use the data um, on using the Christmas bird count data and how it's affecting birds. Uh, federal agencies and state agencies have used the data as well as the State of the Birds report. Um, the, there's one picture here where all, all, all the birds gone. Um, you can go on that website and look at these trends in the birds um, through winter across time. Uh, in 2009, a report was put out by Audubon that showed from Christmas bird count data that birds are shifting their winter ranges based um, 
on the changes in temperatures. And so what we're looking at here is the center of abundance. So that's kind of like the sweet spot, the ideal location where the, it's most abundant for that species. It changed from the 60s to the 2000s. And as our winters have gotten warmer, we've seen huge shifts in the center of abundance of these species. For example, the purple finch here, um, 433 miles. So that, that's a huge shift. That's not just looking at the range edges of that species, that's kind of looking at that core of where that species is, is wintering. And so you can see across the board, we've already seen a lot of changes in, in bird distributions due to climate change. So it's not just a future problem, it's something that we're already experiencing now. Um, and this is just a snapshot of two species from that trend viewer that I mentioned, where you can see that range shifts are happening for widespread species too. So on the left, this is the hairy woodpecker, how it's changed from the 60, 1960s to the um, to 2017. Um, areas in red is where that species has become less abundant, and areas in blue is where it's become more abundant. Um, and you can, you can see for this species that it's really shifted out of the southeast uh, northward. A white crown sparrow on the right, similar story, what we're seeing declines in the east and the south, um, and this species is shifting further north. So these are some of the things that we are, can start to untangle with these data sets, um, and here especially with the Christmas bird count. I also want to highlight that Christmas um, bird count data were used in the report that came out last year that showed that three, um, nearly three billion birds have disappeared since 1970. Um, that's one in four birds that have uh, disappeared. And again, the contributions of our community sciences to this program has helped us understand that there is a bird crisis right now. Um, and this is not something that we would have been able to understand had people not gone out and contributed those data for us in our community science programs. So if you want to get involved with the Christmas bird count, if you're not already involved, uh, I think starting in November, the, you'll be able to see the, the active counts. You can go to the, um, the circles, so just check out our website uh, and check out the Join a Christmas Bird Count. The next program I'm going to highlight is the Climate Watch program. Uh, this is one that I've worked on since I started with Audubon four years ago, um, and it's a really cool program to try to understand and track how birds are shifting to climate change. So, in 2019, just about a year ago actually, I led a report called Survival by Degrees, uh, 389 bird species on the brink. There is a website, if you haven't checked it out, you can go and see how birds in your zip code or your state could potentially be affected by climate change. Um, just put in your zip code and it'll populate which species are potentially vulnerable to climate change. But what we found is when we looked across 604 species in North America, we found that a lot of species are gonna be affected by climate change, particularly the higher uh, global warming scenarios. Here is a one and a half degree scenario for the wood thrush uh, versus a three degree scenario. And what that means is how much warming are we having globally? That translates to different amounts of changes in temperature and precipitation locally. Generally in the US, much higher than that three degree warming globally scenario. And so what we're seeing is areas in red are areas that are becoming no longer suitable for these species based on climate and vegetation. Um, areas in yellow, orange, and green are stable, but they could be worsening or improving. Um, and areas in blue are areas that they could potentially move into. But the moral of the story is, is that when we look at that higher climate change scenario, we found this species is considered highly vulnerable to climate change, as opposed to one and a half where it's considered low vulnerability. But when we looked across all 604 species, what we found was that two thirds of all of the species we looked at were at risk from climate change, severe range loss uh, due to climate change. And so this is really a drastic picture. If you combine the three billion birds, birds are historically um, at a great loss to all the changes that have happened in the landscape. And then we look to the future, there, there's a lot going on that we're gonna have to really um, be monitoring these birds really closely and understand how they're being affected by these broad, like I said, global change issues. So here is an example of a highly vulnerable climate species, the mountain bluebird, uh, cycling through the different warming scenarios. And one of the things that we need to think about with these models is um, what is the potential for this species to actually move through the landscape? This species is up to 53% range loss and a 9% range gain. That's like a lot of change. So how are the birds going to be following this change on the landscape? How closely will their future ranges match our predictions from these, these uh, projections from our models? And so we, re we really need to understand this 
so that we can see how birds are tracking these anticipated changes. And that's where Climate Watch comes in. Climate Watch aims to document these species responses to climate change by having volunteers look in the field um, where the models project they should be by 2020. So we're only looking at this decade. And I think the really cool thing about this program that sets it apart from a lot of other community science programs is that it is a science-driven survey that's based on the latest science of birds and climate change from the report, and that it's monitoring with a purpose. So the hypothesis is to test how birds are shifting their ranges to climate change as it's happening. And so we have a very specific protocol that helps answer that question. Um, and that we'll also use this information to hopefully improve these projections of how these uh, birds are anticipated to change with climate change. So if you wanna practice your birding by ear, you can go to the Climate Watch website. We have um, 12 current Climate Watch species and each of them have a little tab where you can listen to the calls. Uh, that is one way that you can go out and, and identify these species during the surveys. Um, but we have bluebirds, nuthatches, goldfinch, towhees, and painted bunting. Um, and so these are the species that you would go out and survey for in the program. And we use these broad models to, to uh, kind of localize it in your area. This is looking at Madison Audubon Society in Madison, Wisconsin, where we have these models of how the eastern bluebird is anticipated to change in winter. And then we translate that to like a 10 by 10 kilometer grid where each square has a value of, is it improving? Is it worsening? Is it staying the same? Um, and then you would pick a square and go and survey for that bird. And over time, you, you get a sense of if that bird is uh, moving or shifting as you anticipated with climate change from our model projections. We have two survey periods for Climate Watch, which is a little bit different from the CDC, which is just winter. Um, we have a winter survey period, which is um, January 15th, to February 15th. You just go out one day during that period and survey for your target species. But we also have a, a, a spring summer period, May 15th to June 15th, so we can get a sense of how our breeding birds are doing as well. So one really cool thing to highlight is even though this is a new, uh, new program, it just started in 2016, we just this summer published a paper um, in ecological applications that showed that our, our community science program is validating our projections of how birds are going to be shifting with climate change. So we looked at just the bluebirds and the nuthatches for this paper in the first several years of our data. And what we found is across the board, the species that we have enough data to analyze in our statistical model is that all across the board, all of these species in winter and summer are moving into areas that are anticipated and projected to get um, more suitable based on climate change. So essentially these birds are shifting their ranges moving to areas that are changing because of climate change, and we're already seeing that. So this is, a, like I said, a new program, but we're already seeing exciting results out of it. Uh, and if you wanna get involved, there's a, our website, which is here at the bottom. There's a, a new to Climate Watch part of our website, as well as a place where you can uh, hook up with local coordinators. Um, so please check that out. Like I said, our, our next season is coming up in January. And then, just lastly, I really want to stress that as a community science, as a community scientist, you're really contributing to scientific research by collecting data for these programs. So the Three Billion Birds Report, the Survival by Degrees Report, most of these broad reports that look at landscape scale changes would never have been able to happen had it not been for community scientists, volunteers, people who care about birds getting out there and submitting their data online. So thank you to all of you that do already do that. Um, I really hope that more of you will consider doing it. You really help advance the science of global change in birds and I cannot thank you enough for that. Um, but another really cool thing is that you do become an expert on your local birds and the threats that they are facing, such as climate change, such as habitat loss. And so you can be an advocate for birds by speaking out locally to your elected officials as a writing a letter to an editor. You have that really, um, that information based on real life experience that you can share that knowledge and really be an advocate for the birds. Um, and I'll just leave you with this quote. This is one of our Climate Watch volunteers. Again, it's a great way to sort of combine your love of birds with making a scientific contribution that will help benefit them. Um, so I really, again, please consider participating in any of these programs if you don't already. And with that, that's it. You know, I had Short 15 minutes, so hopefully I got it in okay.
Thanks, Brooke. That was that was perfect. Um, I actually want to thank both of you for your presentations um, and for all the people out there joining us tonight. Uh, we're able to provide programs like this with your donations, so please consider making a donation. No amount is too small. If you enjoyed the speaker or you're looking forward to one in the future, I'll drop that link here in the uh, chat box in a minute. Um, but first, let's get to some of your questions. We've had a lot of people who have been dropping questions in, so we'll get we'll just dive right in. Uh, so let's start with um, back to you, Tom. Um, we have some people asking about uh, recording. So one comes from um, Juliet Berger. She asks, how about using voice memos uh, as the app on the iPhone to record bird uh, songs? I think that's a, a good way to make uh, quick audio recordings. I think voice memos doesn't record in a lossless format like Wave. So it records MP3 files, at least on the way I have it set up on my phone. So while it, it does work, I'd suggest trying one of these other apps that will record in a, a lossless format like Wave so that you, you don't lose parts of the audio recording when you go to check it out again later. I just wanted to make one quick note. Um, when I was playing the spectrograms earlier, I know that some people had um, there was a little bit of a, a video lag and some of my voice was coming over the bird singing. So I just wanted to apologize if, if that was the experience anybody had out there, uh, didn't certainly didn't intend it that way from my end. Yeah. And I did drop the link to the recording that we have, uh, streaming on Facebook. So you can always rewatch and everything seems good on my end, which is the one recording. Um, so I think it should be good to go there. So that link has already been dropped. Um, another question about recording. Can you use, Leroy asked, uh, a, a parabolic or shotgun mic with a cell phone? Thanks, Leroy. Yes, you can. Uh, you can use an external microphone with a smartphone. Um, you just need an adapter to connect. So with a, whoops, hang on just a second. With a uh, parabola, parabolic reflector, most of the sound outputs from those are through what's called an XLR jack. So you would need some kind of a, a little converter cable to go from this to your smartphone, but that can be, that can be bought or created uh, from Radio Shack or something like that. And uh, a lot of the smaller shotgun microphones have, have a small, uh, like a stereo mini cable that will connect directly to something like a like a smartphone. And I know um, we've had a lot of links between Brooks Talk and Tom's and lots of resources. So I'm actually going to compile everything um, as far as all the website links, including some of the equipment that Tom discussed earlier. I will make that into a PDF that you can download on our Making Bird Connections website. So if you go to hogisland.audubon.org, I would say by the end of the week, I should have that up so that you can download it and look at some of these links at your leisure. Because uh, I know it's a lot of information and we definitely want you to check all of those out. Um, our next question here uh, is for you, Brooke. And it's, um, we have a couple different people, Marcy and Sarah. Uh, their question was, to be more inclusive, has Audubon thought about renaming the Christmas bird camp? Maybe something like the winter bird count? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, I, I know that this is something that Audubon is considering, and I don't know where the process it, it is, but it, it, it has something that has been brought to our attention. I, I can't give any more information because I don't know any more information, but I do think that it is important for us to be inclusive, and I will say that that is the reason why we have changed the term to community science instead of citizen science, which was the, the, the term that had used prior to that, because we do want to be more inclusive and make everybody feel welcome in all of our programs. So I, I think that Audubon has led the kind of charge in terms of our, our name changing. So I've, I'm sure we, we will uh, think of something. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. I think that's um, great. And also um, interesting to point out the shift from community science to uh, citizen science to community science is something that Audubon did a few years ago and um, 
certainly you will see that if you go to our website or um, look at any of these programs that we're offering, like Climate Watch. Uh, our next question is from Dean Jones. He says, are, do you have any suggestions for aids to help folks that are somewhat hearing impaired to be able to hear bird calls better? Dean, thanks for the question. Um, well, for one thing, I would recommend making audio recordings because if you are doing that and you have a microphone, like a shotgun microphone out there, that's going to capture all of the sound that's that's coming in from the outside world. And then you can, when you play it back, you can both look at the sound and if you need to, you can shift the, the pitch downward. I know there's a lot of um, high frequency hearing loss in particular um, as we get older. Um, and if you are able to shift those pitches downward, which is easy to do on a computer, you can appreciate the sounds at a, at a lower uh, frequency. Now, for actually out in the field, there are some tools that people can wear on their ears that are, that are like hearing aids that will actually do that pitch shifting in real time. And at the moment, I can't for the life of me remember uh, what that tool is called, but um, I know that Lang Elliott uh, helped sort of pioneer that that device. So perhaps somebody can chime in in the chat and uh, let us know what that one's called. Great, thanks for that. And a great suggestion, because that speaker is gonna pick up better sound that maybe you can hear. Um, our next question uh, comes from Doug. He says, uh, what are your favorite bird calls and why? I, and we'll open it up to both of you. Brooke, do you want to go first for that one? Yeah, I, I have to say it's it's always been my favorite bird call and it forever will be my favorite bird call because it was my spark bird, but it's the common loon. I, I don't think you can get any more majestic and like surreal than the common loon. That's a good one. That's a, that's a really iconic sound. For me, um, this answer sort of depends on what mood you catch me in or what day of the week it is but i really like the amusing sounding bird sounds so like the ruddy duck display song or the willow ptarmigan and if you uh if you have the recordings of north american owls there's a cd from cornell there's one recording in particular of the male long-eared owl uh, making this crazy sort of cacophony of cackling calls around the nest and that's that's one of my very favorite bird recordings. Great. And that common loon, for those who have been to Hog Island, it is a common sound of when you're falling asleep at night to hear that call um, at, at Hog Island from the from my um, my rustic accommodations. A lot of times we have the windows open and, and you fall asleep to that to the sound of the loon. So definitely uh, I'm fond of that one. Our next question is from uh, Carol Ann. She asks, are there any suggestions for those who only have a camera with them? You can record video on your camera. Um, so how can you translate that to uh, audio recording? Well, that's a great question, Carol Ann. Um, what you can do is make a, make a video recording with your camera and uh, just try to, to keep your hands as still as possible while you're making that recording. Whether or not you actually have the bird in the image, that doesn't really matter for the audio recording. Just kind of generally point your camera toward the sound. Later, when you bring that file onto your computer, with just about any uh, video software, you can split off the audio track into a different file, and then you're right at the same point you would have been if you had made a recording you know, just with a regular microphone and a recorder. So you can then open that up in Audacity or any of the other uh, audio editing softwares and see the sounds the same way you would any other audio recording. So there's a few questions out there about Hog Island, so I will address those. Um, one was about uh, holiday shopping. We do have an online store. It's through the Project Puffin website. Uh, we have Hog Island themed merchandise there as well. Um, so Project Puffin and Hog Island were all together as one entity. Um, and certainly we share staff and we share resources. So I've dropped the link to our store there for those who are, are thinking about um, that. 
And then I also had a couple questions about Hog Island Camp. Uh, we started in 1936. We have this long history of providing um, week long, or sometimes it used to be two week long, now it's one week long um, camps of all different varieties. I like to try to say that we have something for every type of birder out there. So we have family camps, we have arts and birding, and we have your more traditional like field ornithology. Um, and we started as an educator's camp and we still have an educator's week. And then some of our most popular programs are like the teen birder camps like Tom went to as a young teen. Uh, so definitely check out our website to learn more. Hogisland.audubon.org has a listing of our uh, camps. We have some virtual camps now. We have two virtual online uh, programs. One is focused on puffins. And the other is focused on raptors, and you can um, you can take those online. We have recorded uh, lectures that are from our own Hog Island team filmed on Hog Island, and then we'll also be uh, providing more virtual programs coming into the winter months. So as soon as that is launched, I'll be sharing that here with this group on our Tuesday nights. Um, but Tom and Brooke, you've both been to Hog Island. What what can you share? Um, your favorite thing about um, spending a week on the island. Brooke, do you want to lead off? Yeah, I think one of the things that really struck me is the history there and like being in these cabins that, you know, like so many amazing ornithologists have been in there before. Um, and then spending time with these fabulous people that all kind of come together for a, a common like passion. It's just really an amazing place. And then it's in a beautiful setting like it's just stunning you feel like you're in this like own little community because it's like you go out on a boat to get there and like the birds are fabulous the food is amazing I, I can't say enough about it I can't wait to get back yeah I think for me um, even more than the actual birds themselves uh, it's just an amazing place it's a beautiful island and it's a, a place where you really feel connected to all the people around you that are participating kind of you're there for a common purpose and you're sharing meals in the community dining room and getting together in the fish house in the evening for, for programs. I mean, some of my, my absolute all time favorite experiences have been watching evening slideshows in the fish house with groups of people, you know, they're all excited about birds. So I highly recommend it. If you have the opportunity to get to hog Island, definitely do it. Thanks, uh, both of you, for the kind words. And I think that you both um, hit on something that's really special, which is that community atmosphere. And uh, it's certainly a place for us all to come together. And I'm looking forward to the future when we can do that again. But I am very glad that so many of you logged on and stayed on for, for the end of our presentation. Next week on Tuesday, October 29th, we have a wonderful presentation planned by Jillian Bell about bird-friendly communities. And our bird connection speaker will be Marlene Panton, who will talk about Audubon's Plants for Birds program. I encourage you to register. Um, we have openings on our Zoom login. We'll also be streaming on Facebook. And I appreciate all of you uh, for sticking around. I'll be here to answer a few more questions, but thank you all and I hope you have a great night. Thank you. And thanks Tom and Brooke for everything. Um, this will be streaming over on our Facebook channel. So um, that's already linked. And then I will reach out if I didn't capture all the uh, links to everything, but I, I tried to kind of do it as I was going. Um, but if, if, if there's anything else you want to share in that PDF that I'm going to put up on the website, feel free to just shoot me an email. And that way I can give people, you know, as many resources as possible. I think that'll be really nice. Um, but thanks so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Eva, and, and thanks, Brooke, as well, for your presentation. That was great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. I learned a lot. That was great to watch. Thank yeah, you. loved it. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. And everyone out there, thanks so much for sticking around. We really appreciate your support of Fog Island. Have a good night. <laughs>